Good to go. Okay. I'm going to turn off the heat <laughs> or the AC. I had been working on pianos. Fast forward. I guess this was the start of our company. So 20 years ago, fast forward. Rewind, rewind 20 years ago. And I had been working in this shop in the rebuilding facility and I'd done maybe five years of apprenticing and I thought I had it together. I thought I had arrived. We had this horrible situation happen with my employer, but now Kathy and I were off on our own. We're going to do it. And David knows he's getting the tuning down ish, but he, he knows when it comes to regulation for uh, repair work, for reconditioning, for restoration, just he knows it, right? I know it. I had the opportunity to go and apprentice and do some work with a, an amazing rebuilder, someone who actually builds pianos. And um, as you get into the industry more, you'll know, you'll learn about uh, this, these brothers called the Fondricks, Dell and Daryl. And so they're a big deal in the piano industry in the piano just industry overall because they build pianos and they're they're it and so i had an opportunity to spend a period of time for about a year to go up north about an hour and a half two hours drive every morning to go and just spend time working with dell and i have to tell you it was an incredible learning experience it was traumatic but also really good because when you're around somebody who's at that level, it's like you have to get to that next level or else, I mean, you just, it's just an insane thing. And so I had expected for him to be like, Hey, we're going to go into the DNA of the hammers into uh, uh, the, the curvature of the crown and how to do this and how to do that. And he just looked at me and he's got a very intimidating look. Stacy, have you ever met Dell or Daryl? No. Dell, very intimidating look. And he kind of looks at me, he's like, we're going to do key dip. I'm like, no problem, bro. I got this. I got this. Are you kidding me? You're, I, 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 I'm rebuilding pianos. I can do key dip in my sleep. What followed was day one. He set me up on this grand piano and he's like, here's your dip block. I want it to be exactly this. And he gave me an example. Make it like that. I'm like, okay. Day one, every hour or so for eight hours, he kept on coming down. I'm like, okay, I think I got the dip just right. Come in and he'll just take, he takes one look at it and he goes, all right, nope, do it again. Hour and a half later. All right, Dell, I think I got it. Nope, do it again. This went on for three days literally three days by the end of it i'm just like so distraught i just i don't know what he's feeling what i'm doing i'm questioning life and i just was like just beside myself until finally he goes through it and he's like okay now it's good now it's good after three days eight hours a day keep in mind i'm i'm spending eight hours there plus driving two hours there and driving two hours back to get just my butt handed to me by this like super like ninja tech. It was a learning experience. And he said to me, he said, good enough is good enough if your standards are high enough and I need your standards to be up here. And it was just such this like Jedi moment that I will never forget it. Like it was intense. And so from that moment on, it was just re reiterated to me. And we do that with our text. Key dip is essential. You have got to get it right. You have got to figure it out. You have to use the right tools, the right processes, the right techniques. This is important because this is what the customer feels. This is what the player feels. This is what the concert musician feels. Get it right. No pressure. With that being said, we're talking key dip, baby. <laughs> Since then, I've, I've, I feel like I've come to my, into my own and I kind of know how to do key depth much better. And right here, this is, this is the thing that you will mostly use. It's a dip block. 
I would say that most people will use this. This is a 10 millimeter ebony dip block. And so these are available. You do want to do due diligence and make sure that at this long, uh, the deepest point that it is at actually 10 millimeters. So do be sure to measure it with a, ga with a micrometer. Make sure that that is actually 10 millimeters. Typically, they're a little bit proud, a little bit uh, uh, deeper than that. So you sand it down so that it's exactly at 10 millimeters. Make sure that that's the case. But the real trick is, and we talked about it a little bit last time, is how much pressure to push down. And that was the thing that really... Uh, that I wasn't figure I wasn't figuring it out, and so I was actually putting way too much pressure on the key. And so what I learned is that I was pushing way too much pressure on the key. So in the reality is my sh my dip was not deep enough. I was artificially making it deeper by the amount of pressure I was pushing on it. And so it wasn't until you know, really that I, I found these, which is the, again, this Wessel Nuckel and Gross uh, dip gauge that I was really able to figure out how much pressure. And so this allowed me to go ahead and set what I think it should be about, it's about, should be about here and then test it with this gauge to see if it actually lines up. And so what this gauge does is it allows you to just set it on here and if it's at the right dip you can see it by how much this is protruding through this little dimple is going to be flush it's going to be either too low or too high and you want it to be exactly flush so this my friends is a great tool it's a great investment tool for teaching so again a lot of you won't have instructors uh, uh mentors in front of you this is like a little mentor for you this mentor is going to show you how to do key dip and the right amount of pressure. And so that's what, this is a really good tool for that. It's worth the 80 to $100. Um, I wouldn't say that this is a long-term tool that you'll use, uh, but this is definitely a tool to help you get started to where you know how much pressure and to test yourself. Because the nice thing is that you will have the exact same amount of pressure every time. And this is a fairly heavy piece of, of, uh, a brass. And so you're going to learn really quick how much pressure or, um, or how little pressure to use. So I highly recommend that. Another thing that we talked about is consistency. We talked about this briefly last time, but I kind of wanted to show you the reality is a lot of times you're going to get shown to go to the front of the key with this. I say, you know what, that's fine. But for consistency's sake, go to the back side of that. So always, every time you're going through it, put it, push it down to the back end. And what you'll want to do is get to where you know how much pressure to put on that, putting it all the way to the back to where it is exactly 10 millimeters. Now, to be honest, I like to give myself a little bit more than 10 millimeters a dip. I've just found that that gives me a little bit of extra aftertouch and I find that that just helps me out with my customers. So I probably give a little bit too much. I would say my brother, Adam, errs on the side of maybe a little bit too little. <laughs> I'm sure one of us will eventually get it just right, but that's typically what we found. So again, I'm always going to be pushing it down so that it butts up against that sharp, just so that I have consistency every time. Questions about that so far? Pretty straightforward. But again, we have to put a lot of weight on it because this is where the customer, this is the first impressions. And it doesn't take long for it to, what angle am I looking at there, Victor, with those hammers? Do you have something vertically hanging over your head? No, the, the action standing up on its side here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what can go wrong? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so just, just be extra sure that you're getting that 10 millimeter dip or a little bit more. I would say that erring on the side of a little bit more than a little bit less. 
Now, as a, I'm not a huge player, but um, from the players I've I've worked with, they've seemed to all agree that there's more issues when there's not enough dip than when there's a little bit too much dip. They just feel that instantaneously. Victor, you're more of a player. Would you agree with that, or would you say no? You for you, you like a little bit less dip. No, definitely greater dip. Um, it just gives you a better sense of uh, completion, I guess, since there's more going down. If it's too shallow, it doesn't feel like sometimes you're even. You're like, is it supposed to go down more? Or it, it's yeah, just, it's a weird feeling. Yeah, it doesn't feel right. So feel yeah, like you're getting stopped more. as opposed to pushing through. Exactly. Yeah, it feels like sometimes, like yeah, is something getting stuck or you know, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that Yamaha really changed the game with their pianos being becoming so popular, and they have a really hefty ten millimeter dip, and and everybody always says, "I want, I love how easy a Yamaha is to play. I wish you could play like a Yamaha." That's something that we're hearing more and more and more. It used to be, "I want my pianos to play and sound like a Steinway," and now and more and more, it's like, "I want it to play like a Yamaha." And so there's just a lot of that is something that's super easy and easy to replicate. And a lot of that really just starts with the dip. A lot of times I come to the customer's houses that key level's too low, making it so I can't get that proper 10 millimeter dip. So when I'm able to level the keys and get just a nice 10 millimeter dip, boy, everything seems to get, sit right and just be perfect. So that's typically what I'll use. I'll use one of these two devices or tools for the dip. Again, this is a great one to get started as you're learning, but this one in the end is gonna be faster. If you can get to the point where you can go through really quickly, go through, and you're gonna be able to get it very consistent and very quickly having it done. And so I would really recommend upgrading to this eventually, pushing yourself. But in the meantime, this is what we have all of our technicians use as they're getting started, and then they test themselves with it. Well, where would I have put this? Oh, okay. I'm. I. This is how I feel uh, for that because this is a great gauge. This shows you what perfection should be and consistency should be. Now it's up to you to adapt that with this dip block. So again, that's a great tool to start. A quick question, David. Yeah. Uh, when you're using the block, are you feeling the very front of the block or kind of near Good. the middle of the block? Yeah, that's a great question. I get that a lot. What I do is right at the middle of the block. Not here, not down there, but right in the middle. I've had some people go to that, but this feels like it kinks my finger a weird way is bringing towards the front. So I always just kind of feel this natural right here. And that's about at the center of this dip block right here. I guess if okay. you're doing the tip of the key, that could also be a problem if you're doing an old piano that has chipped ivory or stuff like that, where it's not consistent Correct. at the tips. Yep. That's a really good point. Um, and keep in mind for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm left-handed, but I will always go from left to right. And that's, that's just my rhythm. I'll go from left to right. And, and, and that's just kind of how I've always done it. Have you, have you ever tried to figure out since you're pushing it back, uh, you're saying the last meeting that you probably, your dip is actually probably more than 10. Have you ever yeah. figured out like the exact number? If I had to guess, I think it's close to 11. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I feel like it's close to 11. And, um, because I'm also noticing that I'm able to get that usually my regulations and grands the 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 uh, blow distance is a little bit deeper uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know more intense um yes. but again i do a lot of work for more like co like concert level people so that they're really like they're wanting that um so i don't know if that plays into it and i get a lot of good feedback from that so i just kind of stay with it i would say that the more i think about it the shallower my dip ends up being because I overthink it and then it gets smaller and smaller. That typically uh, is the case with me. But if I'm just relaxed, quickly doing this, it tends to be like 11, you know, 10 and a half to 11. Um, I will say uh, the last full regulation I did on an upright, I noticed that my dip block was, I thought it was always 10 because that's what I ordered, but I measured yeah. it and it's, it's closer to nine and a half. And so then oh. I was like, yeah, I don't like that. 
and so then my mentor, I asked, like, do you have a 10 uh, millimeter block? He's like, no, but I have a 10 and a half. And he's like, this is what I use like for almost everything. Yeah. And I use that. And I will say when I was done, I really enjoyed the way it, it felt. So yeah. I was like, man, maybe I should, you know, maybe not use a 10 and a half, but yeah, definitely lean yeah. on a larger dip. I really yeah. Like Another thing that you can do, Victor, and I've done this before is, and it's usually because of my own error. Like I'll like, okay, I have this dip block. I need to sand it down and I sanded it too far. So I actually just put a little mm. bit of blue tape, layers of blue tape on it oh, to kind of build it back up. <laughs> yeah. So I've done that before. That's a good idea. Yeah. The, the only thing is the other ones I have, they're the, they're like shallow in the, in the middle. It's really only, I don't know if you've seen Yeah. That, there's like a groove in the middle and it only has like wood on the sides. I, yep, I I, yeah, I've had those. And I finally just was like, no. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really push yourself. Um, again, if you think about it, if you're, if you're using my technique and this is a, you know, a 10 millimeter dip block, the reality is if I'm right here at the front, that's right at 10 millimeters. I'm going to be a little bit, yeah, let's do that really quick. I'm just curious. Let's do this. So I'm going to go ahead and just test it right here. I'm just going to go ahead and put a couple punchings in. And so I want to test out and see, okay, if I'm flush at the very front, what does that feel like for when I actually push it all the way to the back? Always make sure to kind of press it in like that, by the way, just so you know that it's kind of compressed down. And I did a big no-no where I just put the punchings on top of the punch of the felt. Don't do that. This is just for, <laughs> just don't do that. So here it is. Yeah, sure enough. So right at dip right here, I'm right flush. If I press it down, I'm too high. I want to go down further. So right here, I'm flush here. I'm off by a good, a pink punching. So that is that last little bit. So here it is. I'm nice and flush right with the front. That's probably a perfect 10. But, but if I press it all the way down to the back, I need to take out one of these punchings. Probably one of the pinks and it'll probably be just right. Let's see. Yep, that's what I like. That's what I like. Sorry. <laughs> so it's off by just that amount. So um, it gives you just that little bit, just that little bit. So David, if, if, if you're working on key dip at a customer's house where you're making adjustments, are you taking your punchings and using scissors to cut a, a wedge and sliding them under with tweezers? What, what is your process as far as that? Yeah, so my process as far as like a, um, are you talking about a grand, uh, Michael, or either, or? Yeah, you can talk to either, yeah. yeah. I would think that on an upright, it might be easier that you might be able to pop out the key, but on a grand, you're less likely to. Yeah, so on an upright, it's, it's super easy to do key level and key dip on an upright piano, um, just because you don't have to mess with anything. So... Um, you know, with an upright piano, we got these nice little jigs right here. So let's just kind of look at this upright. It's easy. You take the key stick, uh, 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 you know, key up stop rail off. And now you have full access to the keys. You can get underneath them and put punchings underneath the balance rail for a key level. And then underneath the front rail for the key dip. So I simply will go ahead and use my tweezers. I use a, I just use a set of tweezers like this. These work great. And I simply lift up on the, um, there you go. Just simply lift up and that's it. Always remembering to put the cardboard punching underneath. Whoopsie. So that's typically my protocol. I know they make some different kind of flatter tweezers and stuff like that. And I've used those before that look like more of like a shovel, a spade shovel. Yeah. And I have one of those and it's, that's effective for when I wanted to strip out the old stuff. 
Yes. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes I used it to help push them down, you know, stuff down when I want to at least put things on initially. Yep. Yep, exactly. So now I'm just. So they, they still, I thought, were, were functional and, and were, were good. That I, I was glad that I bought them because I thought they helped, especially on the removals, because sometimes the the um the paper punching stick to the 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 rails and become very difficult to pull off and those yeah. help yeah are you talking about this little thing here yep Michael? that's exactly it exactly okay. that right. exact tool yeah yeah whatever it's yeah. called yeah so again i thought that tool lifter, worked I think fine but i called. found that just the tweezers for me are faster because it's they're thinner, I can go in and out really quickly. I can go side to side. These I'm more efficient with these for me, and I like having less tools. So this is this covers more ground for me. I can do more more different tasks with with this one particular tool. But that's how I'll do all the uprights. Just simple, easy, easy peasy. You don't have to do really anything else. Now for grand pianos, I'm gonna go grab my action model. The reality is that for grand pianos, doing the key dip is really the same. You know, this, the key dip is going to be identical to this. No big deal. Just like the upright, I'll go ahead and just lift up the key and then slide the punching. It's actually, this dip is really too deep. So simply pressing it all the way in. I feel like there's an extra, there's too much space there. So I'm gonna go ahead and take up that space with a couple punchings. And again, repeating the same thing. And that's good. The only, the caveat is, is, is it's only in my leveling that I will do that trick where I slice the punching and slide it under. And honestly, I'm only doing that at the last final pass, the last 5%. What I'm doing in, in, in the interim is I'm actually putting marking with punchings like this, what I need to do. So for instance, I'm putting my key leveling stick over the keys and then I'm basically just kind of tapping them upwards. And depending on how much space is or how much of a spacer is needed, I'll put them on these pins right here. Then I'll remove the uh, stack, lift up the keys, and then put them on under individually, just like that. That's a great idea, David. I never thought about that. Wait, that's not a I'm thing? Gonna... No, I've never thought about that because usually I put them on the key tops and then, you know, I take the stack off. Oh, my gosh. It. That's a great idea. They'll never move. Oh, they never God. move. I, feel so dumb. <laughs> I can't believe I never Okay, so, yeah, there you go. I mean, hey, just so you know, my entire lesson was on that thing. And so that's it. Good job. I'll see you later. <laughs> no, but the reality is, to Victor's point, sometimes these pins – aren't as as they're not protruding as far as others and one time i did sneeze or cough no. and it just went, like three or four of them were gone but i would imagine that happens a lot to you victor if you're not putting them on these lips yeah or sometimes you'll, you'll pull the stack off aggressively and then the keys will <laughs> yeah. down and they'll, they'll go to the side yeah <laughs> no so this is this is the way i've always been taught and this is the way we teach our technicians is just simply put them on the balance rail pins like so, remove the stack, lift the keys up, put them underneath. You're good. So this will we what I'll, I'll probably do two passes and then I'll go through and do a final pass where I'm simply putting like I'm guessing out of the entire thing, I might put a, a dozen or so. And they're usually the ultra thin white ones. Because I'm only off by a little bit. So like what Michael was saying, I'll cut this. I'll cut a little uh, 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 section out. And then I'll go ahead, lift my action, lift the key, and feed it all the way down underneath. Let's see if I can kind of see it in the picture. 
Lifting up that key, I'll slide it underneath the key bed like this and into place, trying to lift that punching and slide it underneath that felt punching, and then we're good to go. So again, it's only for that last 5%. The bulk of everything you're going to do is you're putting them on these key pins, removing the stack and putting them on. And again, you'll, you might do it three or four times, especially as you're getting started and figuring out, okay, there's this much slop that equates to this, this punching. <laughs> and that takes a while. And I, I still mess that up where I'm like, oh, I think it's this much. And I sure enough, I'll go and I'll, I'll overshoot it. So now I have to take a punching out. David, is there a certain order that you go through as far as the screws on the, the action stack to, to remove? Do you do the, the front I screws, do. back screws? Do you do all the thinner ones and the, the end corners? What's the order that you normally do? What I typically do, um, yeah. So what I typically do, I think this is going to be the easiest way to show you. Because so typically your average action has um, about ten, uh, about ten screws, right? So you have. Front. That sounds right. Around five, five action brackets that the rails exactly. are connected to. Yeah. So yes, I do them in a certain order, and I repeat them in that order. Four, five. Okay. So typically, when I'm removing the stack. I'm gonna do this. Let's see if I can get a better angle. I don't know if I can get a better angle. Yeah, so it it that that's a really good question because we do want to do consistency, and that's the bigger thing that we want is consistency over everything else. Is whatever you do, do it every time the same amount. Um, and just so you can give yourself just that consistency. So what I typically do is these two, the first, the right side and the left side. I'm always gonna be attacking those screws first. So usually I'll remove the front ones and then the back ones. And then when I'm removing these, I'm keeping them all in order by the way. And it doesn't really matter when I'm removing the rest of them. And in fact, if I had to, if I had to kind of go and rewind, when I'm removing the stack screws, I actually don't pay that big of attention now that I'm thinking about it. It's only when I'm reinstalling the stack that I'm doing something. So typically I'll just unscrew everything. And a lot of times I'm actually keeping them, <laughs> if I can, inside the actual bracket. Oh, Just so you're like, basically getting them so they'll be loose. You lift the stack, the, the screws stay in their, their brackets. And then when correct. you set them down, then you have to pull them out as you put the action brat. Yeah, and a lot of times I can just back up that screw and it kind of resets itself out and just fine. So, but then what I do is if I'm looking at all these screws, I'm just going to remove them um, because the, I, I pay way more attention to this portion of it. I will always go ahead and install the, my two ends, the back one first, then I'll install the front ones. Then I will, so now that I know on the left and the right side it's locked in, and then I will hit one of the middle back. Then again, that middle front, middle back again, middle front, middle back, then middle front. Typically what I'll do, and I'll either, depending on where it's at, space it out. If I like, okay, I want to hit the one that's closest to the center of the action. And so sometimes it's like that. And then other times, and then I can kind of hit the two. That's so typically what I'll do. You're doing outside to in and back to front as a that's general right. rule. That's right. That's what I've found success in. Now, keep in mind, sometimes you're going to come across like Young Chang actions or Samic actions that are like stripped out those screws. I've had to redo those. And then when you put them in and you see, and it and like your keyed levels off for whatever reason. So just know that that's kind of some, something that you have to deal with sometimes. In fact, sometimes a lot of times what I do is like, if I know I'm going to work on a lower grade grand action, I'll take some of the thin set CA glue. Once I've removed those action screws and I'll drizzle some of that into the hole. 
So what that does is it basically solidifies all of that potentially fairly soft wood in there and hardens it up. So again, that thin set CA glue, letting it wick it down into that hole, getting in, into the thread of that hole, and it really solidifies it so that when I go and screw it in, it has something harder to bite onto. Does that make sense? It's kind of a weird thing to do, but that's what I found sometimes kind of is a good preliminary thing to do. Are you taking that st action stack for grand off in the home? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Typically, I'm doing all this work in the home. By the way, a technician showed me this, and I want to do this. But, of course, it needs to be branded artisan. They <laughs> use the piano top. But they put a um, a yoga mat on it. It was a brilliant idea. It's thin. It fits in the car. And so what they did is they made it so that that lid flap, they used that as kind of a workbench. But they put this yoga mat over it and sat it on there. And they can do their, you know, hammer line, evening that out and stuff like that. It's a cool idea. Yeah, I actually have a, a roll-up table that has legs that disassemble that i'm mm -hmm. using to tr as a travel table so i can just yeah. in the home That's it's good. a little yeah. you know small you know small card table essentially but it's it's yeah. able to be disassembled and rolled up so it doesn't take up a ton of space so one of the things that we're really kind of talking about we're kind of dancing around it is the the idea is that long term you need to get to where you can feel what is correct but early on, you're going to kind of just need to be able to see what is correct. And that will take a little bit of time. And so, again, when this is in the correct, you know, when it's dropping down just right, this will be totally level right here. You'll see that that little isn't too high, isn't too low. It's just right. It's a very easy visual cue. This is another one of those nice, easy visual cues. So this is a sharp dip tool. And the way you use it is you actually are going to feed it through in between the naturals all the way down so that you're actually hitting this. So you're hitting the, and that's why this has a little curvature to it. You feed it through and make it so it actually is touching and hitting that balance or that front rail for the sharp and the, what it is, is this is exactly 10 millimeters. This is 10 millimeter diameter. So in theory, if you stick it all the way through here and butt it up against here, you want this space to be just, sorry, I think this key brushing is too tight. So it's throwing me off. So you want this to be able to not move at all, but also you don't want to make sure it's not lifting that sharp. So if it goes here perfectly and, he, and there's no space, you know this is set exactly right. But if you stick this tool in there and it pops up, then we know we need to take out punchings. If you stick this tool in there and there's excess slot, you know you need to add punchings. So this is a very nice, very easy to use, simple tool for that. Probably the cheapest tool you can get to for that. And it's a lot easier, I have to tell you, than kind of the old school method that, that we actually even teach you at the PTA. We taught you to use this technique and I'll use it, I'll show you on this one. It'll be a little easier. But that is where, whoa, that is where you actually touch the rear where at, at, of the, the keys at rest, the natural and the sharp at rest versus depressed. And you match that. Again, that's a way you can do it, but it's a little bit more difficult. So again, you're touching it and feeling what the difference is at rest and then making sure to match that when the sharp and natural are depressed. Again, this is a much easier tool to use than that and a lot quicker. What about, so, uh, yeah. have you ever seen somebody use a nickel? I have, yes. And so that trick is 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 pretty cool too. And that's a very simple one. And, and it basically is just this. And you can also kind of make your own. I've seen some people kind of do the same thing where they take two, two pinks and they glue them to a cardboard. 
to give it a little bit long, you know, more of a feel. So they'll, they'll basically make their own quote unquote nickel, slide it up to here, press down and see if that's level. Is that the trick you're talking about, Victor? Yeah, that's what, that's a, that's how our mentor taught us. I thought that's how everybody did it. Uh, but I mean, it works really well. Um, it always comes out feeling pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it only cost you five cents. Yep, exactly. <laughs> That's true. Victor, you found the you found the least expensive one. Yeah. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Until you lose your nickel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get a sticking key all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, there's quite a few different ways to actually do key dip. The biggest one that is that you get consistency. Even if you're a little bit too deep, if you're not deep enough, as long as you're consistent, that's the key. Is, is you want to be really fairly close, but the consistency is key. And that was one of the things that, that Dell was showing me is that I wasn't being consistent. And to be fair, I wasn't going nearly deep enough with my dip at the time. And so it was a big learning curve for me, despite having worked on pianos for about four or five years and thought that I was doing pretty well. That was a definite learning curve. And that's another reason that if you can find somebody to kind of show you a little bit, like in person, if you can get it, say, hey, can you check my dip? Am I, is this right? For those that don't have that option, this is a great tool for that. I just looked online at Shaft and they have nickels for $25. Nuh-uh. <laughs> I'm just making a joke. Oh my gosh, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it's basically a nickel with Shaft on it. <laughs> I'm like, no, no. You got him, Johnny. You got him. Yeah, you got me. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like a brass nickel with shaft on it. I would be surprised. Uh, questions about this and dip. Because, again, the dip is a big one, and we really want to make sure that you all are understanding all the concepts behind it. I have a dip question. If you can't go down enough and you can't take any more off, it's down as far, but you need more dip. Are you just going to increase the, the blow distance? So, yeah, you have several options. And, and, and yeah, that is, well, you would decrease it, right? You would decrease the blow distance. So if you can't get your dip deep enough, that means that you need to lessen the amount that that hammer needs, it can travel. And yes, I've done that where I'm like, okay, I can't get deep enough to allow that jack to escape. So I need to artificially get a jack escapement by moving the hammers closer to the strings. And I've had to do that with old uprights because a lot of these old uprights weren't meant to have that big of a key dip. And so even if you're raising that hammer, or excuse me, even if you're raising that key level, sometimes you're just not able to get that full 10 millimeter dip. And so I'm like, okay, I guess I'll get nine and a half or nine, but then that means I'm adjusting that hammer line blow distance to where we're closer to the strings, usually about that one and three quarters. That's a good question though. So yeah, the answer is sometimes you just have to fuss, you know, compromise in another way. So if the standard for the piano for the hammer blow distance was one and seven eighths, you would need to move it down to one and three quarter. Exactly. Since you didn't have the dip. Exactly, exactly. And that's why with a lot of my customers, I'm able to go a little bit further than one and seven eighths giving me more of that blow distance, which means I have more power and it's just a little bit deeper. So they don't usually complain about that, but then they're like, wow, I got so much power out of this. What'd you do? So yeah. And again, that's more acceptable. I would say in, in, in uh, grand pianos, especially longer grand pianos than an upright. Speaking of grand piano sizes, how much is the key stick length change from like a, a five to six foot grand to a, a more like eight foot, nine foot concert grand? How much longer is the key stick in, or is it does it change that much? Yeah, that's a great question. It actually can be quite a bit larger. So for instance, I work on a lot of nine foot concert grand Simon D's, D's and David. And they're, they're tapered. So if they're longer stick down to a, slight, a shorter stick on the treble. And so you're going to see that where most piano actions, grand actions you see are going to be like a perfect rectangle, 
these will be tapered longer in the base. Now, some manufacturers, I believe it's Busendorfer, have, and maybe even, I think also Schimmel. Uh, uh, Stacy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're marketing now as creating a nine, uh, a, a larger concert grand action. So you'll have a seven foot piano, but they'll say it has the same concert action as a nine footer. And so they're experimenting more with that, but no, they will be a good four inches, I would say, okay. larger in the base. So it can be significant grands. for those large concert grants then. Yeah, yeah, because we're trying to hit it at that one seventh of speaking length and that's how they're doing it. Yeah, that makes sense. So so how are they able to achieve that then in a, in a shorter grand, if, you know, that if the, you're, it's changing the strike point, not changing the strike point, but it feels like it'll be harder to get where you get it where you want. So they're basically hitting it at one seventh, but they're instead of the first seventh of it, they're hitting it at that second seventh of it. Oh, what? does that make sense? Yeah. Huh. So that's how they're doing it. <laughs> so if the string's here, instead of hitting it here, they're hitting it down here. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And have, have you been able to tell a tonal difference in those? No. 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 It, it worked on me that I was like, well, this is kind of cool. It was probably just all marketing. <laughs> but I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in theory, and again, I haven't do, uh, dove that much into the action geometry stuff. Um, but there's, you know, the reason is, the cantilever, the systems and the geometry and everything is just better in a concert grant because they can they can have more leeway and do funner stuff. So that's the idea behind it. It's like, hey, we can get this this special, um, you know, downweight, upweight, uh, just everything, just that much more dialed in with these concert grant actions. And so that's what they're marketing. Stacy, was it Busendorfer? Or who, do you remember who it was that was doing that? Sorry, Schimmel was doing it. Yeah, it was Schimmel. I think yeah, it was you're Schimmel. right. I was actually yeah. studying Schimmel because I was like, I don't know the value of these pianos, this brand. I just didn't know much about it today. So like during lunch, I'm like looking. I posted <laughs> in the chat there the models that have the fully key length. It's their concert okay. series one. Yeah. So I just read that today. So random. That is funny. This is all on today. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's a thing. It's a thing, and you're gonna come across once you start working on your concert grand actions, the the lame thing is a lot of times you're working on these concert grand actions and you have to take them back to the shop. And so you pull them out and be like, Oh gosh, it is like, they ain't no doing this little number, which I typically do like a pizza. No, you're like <laughs> kind of a thing. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's a deal. I don't know, Victor, if you've worked on very many of those. Yeah. That the university. Yep. Universities. Time. Yeah, they're they're paying to pull out, and you're having to go take them to the parking lot where your car's at, which is I mean, quarter mile down the road. It feels like. Yeah, I, I haven't taken one of the car yet. I just I work on them there. Usually I'm left alone, so I can leave it taken apart in the you know, the piano room. But no, I'm not looking forward to the day I got to carry one out to the car. Yeah, no, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so today I was at a customer's house, and um, I had actually I think. Fun story, actually, you all were with me at this customer's as well. She has the Busendorfer that I put the new hammers on that I was putting, you know, done all that. Apparently, it's getting a lot of uh, notoriety. I didn't know about this, but people are loving it and people are asking about it. And what did we do and all this other stuff? So it was really cool. But she was complaining. She's like, I just it's got these weird bobbling notes now. And sure enough, I get there and that hammer line had um, had lowered. And so, again, new hammer shanks and flanges, everything else was original. Can you, anybody guess what had, what happened there? Why would they have lowered again, only new hammer shanks and flanges. So what lowered? So anybody. What, the, the, the new hammers that were put on? Yep. It was just new hammers, shanks, flanges. What broke in? The knuckle? Boom. That knuckle, ever so slightly, broke in 
to now be a little lower. And so what did I do? I just had to raise that hammer line up just a little bit. And now I had perfect escapement of that jack and right amount of aftertouch. But it was surprising. But then again, she's a teacher. She's a high-end performer. She plays her hours and hours every day. So it wasn't necessarily flat, but it wasn't as spongy as it was when I first put it on. And so that was within the last six months. It had lowered, I would say, a good two millimeters, which is a, a, significant, a significant amount. So the hammers overall had lowered just, so if that is where they should be, I would say that they had lowered just about there. So was that the leather that broke in or is it the, exactly. the core of the knuckle? What, what part of that kind of broke in or both of it? It was just the leather that broke in. It was just the leather that broke in ever so slightly. And I could feel around it and, and an, around it was nice and spongy, but right where it broke in, where that jack is touching it, it had compressed and compacted. And that just, I would say that a, a half a millimeter of break in here led to about two millimeters of lowered distance right here. Would you recommend Wait. maybe, I'm sorry. No, like go on ahead. A, on a, for somebody like that, you know, that, that is probably going to tell the difference. Do you maybe recommend like pounding the keys with like a key pounder to, to artificially break them in? Or do you think that's not going to do it? It needs more than that. What I, what I typically do is tell them, hey, I'll come back in about a month and I'll just quickly touch some stuff up. And so usually spend an hour of just doing a little bit of extra. That's more than enough time. Um, I was actually, I hadn't been there in months. So yeah, I was going to ask what the months. time frame was from when you had done the, the hammer reinstallation to when they called you. Yeah, I. Like, like five months, right? Five, yeah, to, six five months. to six months. Yeah, yeah it was. It was. It was and it cool. wasn't. Can you, anybody guess where in the piano it was having that issue? Mid range. Middle. Right, right in that the, uh, center area. The extremes were fine. I hardly had to move any of those. So it took me 10 minutes. It was really easy. And then she was right, just, like, you're oh, just no. adjusting the, the, the repetition lover height, right? Um, is that right? Yeah. I'm, I'm adjusting the capstan right here, which yes, is, is adjusting the, the right. The so you're moving height. the whip in, which adjusts the, where yep. the repetition lever hits onto the knuckle. Yep. Yeah. And so I just moved it just ever so slightly upwards and it was fine. Um, because she called me, she, she's like, she's like, okay, David, I don't know what you can do. I don't know if you can fix this, but this is what it is. And so she explained it and she kind of showed me and I'm like, I got it. No problem. And she's like, David, you're like, if I'm having a baby, you're like the epi what do they call it? A, a, a epidural person. It's like I'm having a panic, and once you get the once you get the guy coming in with the drugs, and he's like, "I got this, I can help you." That's what it feels like. Thank you. And Anesthesiologist. So, anesthesiologist. She's like, "That's yeah, cool. I guess like, yeah, I think they're the ones that do epidurals. <laughs> so funny. So yeah, where you, so, where you so, feel so, no pain. So yeah, but I kept the tolerances really tight in her piano because she, again, she she's a high end performer. Um, so my 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 dip was maxed out. My blow distance was maxed out. I really, it was, they were practically on that. They were practically already on this uh, 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 whipping, you know, or the uh, rest rail felt because I wanted to expand that blow distance to give it as much as I can because I wanted enough power. And then my, um, my, my let off was really tight as well. So again, just the tolerances are ever so slight. And I just wanted to keep it at that. The way I talk about it with my concert artists is like, I'm, I'm dialed it in like a race car. This isn't to go drive to Walmart and back. This is like to perform with. And so usually they kind of get that and they're like, okay, I'm okay with that. But you have to be sure to let them know that before you, you do that to their piano because it, it's different. It's a different beast. Talking about let off real quick, David. So yeah. you will, uh, like what you're saying, you'll get extremely close. Uh, uh, how close will you get? Like, will you pretty much get like almost to where it's hitting the string, like pretty much as close as you could possibly get it? Yeah, it's a good, it's probably a 16th of an inch. And what I'll do is, is I'll, and when I'm doing this level of regulation, I'm kind of past looking at it. And what I'll do is I'll do more of, whoa, what's going on? I'll do more of just a feel test. And so what I'm doing is taking it 
and like not even looking at my measurement really, but I'm going through and going like, I want to hear it whistle a little bit. Mm. And I want that same amount of whistling of that note. Oh, I see. That's Every time. So it's just that, that little bit. So you're using a combination of feel and listening to it mm -hmm. to set that from your experience. Exactly. For some reason, I, I, you know, when I started doing regulation, I always thought that let off was a 16th of an inch, not an eighth. Oh, and so yeah. I, I had to kind of always set it like that, you know, pretty close. Yeah. And extremely close, but I always found that it, it's really good. Like that's how I, that's totally. how I like it. Yeah. And if it's like my piano or, you know, like the piano at the church, um, at my church, yeah, I experiment, you know, I like to try to get it pretty close and it, it just feels, I, I feel like you have so much more control, especially when you're playing quieter. If you're trying to play I, really I, quiet. I agree. I agree. It's just the only way that really works is if you have a real, a good key dip, you know, that's a little bit deeper, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit deeper. And, and, and I like to have a fairly large blow distance because mm -hmm. I want to, I want them, because remember that bigger, that blow distance, the more momentum that hammer can get to really have a lot of power. Yes. So again, I maximize that blow distance, maximize that key dip, but minimize that let off. That's kind of my, that, that the secret sauce, if you will. Yeah. I guess I learned that accidentally. I, I just, I, I always thought it was 16th smaller. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> Be really quick before we go, this is the last one I want to show you. And this is a Jarus jig. This is a great jig. Again, this is one of those visual ones. So they make this into a couple different size models, but the idea behind it is very simple. Let's say this is set at 10 millimeters. I will use this all day long for my sharps. It's for me, I would say that this is probably the fastest. It's not as cheap as the nickel trick, but this is set to 10 millimeters. So I'll put it more towards the front of the key. Every time I'll hit it the right spot and push down. So right now you see there's that extra space. It means I want to put some punchings in there because I want this to be totally flush. Very simple jig. So I know that I need to put some spacers underneath there because it's going down too deep. That piston is going down further than what it should. I love this tool. It's called a Jarus jig. You can and use that for the level as well, right? Really? I mean, I feel like I've seen. I feel like that would take a long time. Yeah, I feel like I've seen people. You said it like the opposite, so that when you push it up on the black key, if it goes up or down. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I see. I thought you meant for like naturals. I'm like, really? Oh no. Oh yeah. No. For, yeah. For this. No, no, you're right about that. Yeah, so yeah, you can use this to also set the, the sharp height. Mm -hmm. That's right, so that purpose. if you're doing key leveling, yes. So um, a lot of times it's that second one. But yeah, you would just adjust this to say, let's just say that this is set perfectly, this height on this sharp. So what we would do is set it so. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of have it at that. You know, you can see there's this lip right here. So I'll yes. set it so that at this rest position, this is perfectly level like that. Boom. So I know that this sharp is at the right height. I'll move it down to make sure that that second lip is perfectly level. Hmm. So a great tool. I highly recommend this. So this these are really kind of the go-to dip, you know, tools right here. You got your standard dip block make sure that it's actually 10 millimeters you got this crazy little hammer -y jig right here adam introduced me to this one same with this one actually do you know where where the hammer one came from um erwin yeah it's the erwin okay. brothers uh supply Piano Forte. Piano Piano Forte. Forte. Ex exactly yeah now uh question david uh yeah if you're taking your ptg exam because right, you're saying that you like to push your dip block back, and that's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna increase yeah. it. Do you think they would tell you something if you did that? Do you think it'd be I found safe in the exam to do it in the front? If you all haven't realized this, I'm kind of a punk at sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I don't know. I just am. Sometimes I kind of have fun with it. And at 16, you could imagine me being that much more. And so they asked me because they I found out that they ask you stuff like, well, why did you do this? Hmm. 
And so I think I said some kind of a smart ass answer, like, well, I'm actually set this for a very high end player that was really demanding. And so he wanted to play some passages that were like this. So I wanted, and so I started doing all this stuff and, da, 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 and they're like, that sounds good. You know what you're talking about. That was my experience back in the day. And so I kind of was like, here's how I said it. Here's why I kind of had fun with it um, because I had a lot more experience in the, re the regulation. So I found, and I think it's still the case that if you could explain the why you're good. Mm, that good being said, that. I would probably stick to that. If I had to do it over again, I would yeah. probably just stick to their measurements and just be like, Hey, I, I said it, I said it to your 65 height. You got a 10 millimeter dip and it's one seven eights and da, 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 da. yeah. And would, will they check your tools? Uh, no. no, no, from what I've read in, in the exam source books, they're looking at the final results, not necessarily mm -hmm. how you got there. Cause sometimes there's more than one way to get there. Mm -hmm. And they're really looking at what is your final results and then comparing the metrics of what the standard is or what they've determined, you know, you know, for example, in tuning, they have a, a process that is standardized so that it's regardless of who the testers are, if they follow the test procedures, everybody will be standardized on the test. And I think the 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 technical exam is the same way that they're wanting it set a certain way as far as the metrics. And as long as you hit the metrics, it doesn't matter how you get there. Yeah. yeah, I think to David's point, they still might ask you questions, and you've got to be able to explain yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's you have to be able to explain yourself, not necessarily whether there's a right or wrong answer. Yeah, yeah. So it would be safe to use like the WNG dip tool. And absolutely, one. absolutely. The only trick is, and as you see right here, you're going to get this is literally the exact same models that you're going to use in the exams. It doesn't really work here. Doesn't really work on a three note action. Oh, that makes sense. So, but you could customize this a bit if you wanted. You could like, you know, remove this, put this on here, you know. But again, they want to make sure that you know it. You know, you're like, okay, hey, I noticed you would, they would say, hey, I noticed your dip wasn't quite deep enough. What did your thought? What were your thoughts on that? You're like, yeah, I wasn't quite deep enough. So what I did is I made it so that the hammer line was a little bit closer to give me proper after touch. I think I'm within a good range. You know yeah. what? You're right. That's pretty good. I'm glad you thank you for explaining that. Mm, that's good to know. Yeah. 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 I'll say one more last thing about key dip. Um, I would say the the further that dip is also, I feel like it makes the key feel heavier. You know, I guess just since there's more to be pressed down. And I always like an action to feel heavier. Yeah. Uh, the people I grew up around, my, my dad, right, he's a professional pianist, and he always he was always talking about that, you know, how heavy the piano feels. And so I guess I just got used to that. And so, yeah, when it's more shallow, it just feels real light, I guess. And it just doesn't feel right. So... I guess it's, you know, I don't know why it makes it feel heavier. I guess, again, because you got to more, you got to go further. But, you know, again, yeah. that's something to think about. It, it feels like you just have to go in further. Your fingers have to just travel more. But conversely, when your fingers are getting held up when it's not deep enough, it can also have that feeling of it feels heavy. It feels like my yeah. fingers are having to work so, hard to get, yeah. the, which is my situation today. Even though the dip was fine, the let off was okay. But that blow distance wasn't giving me enough aftertouch. So she was feeling, this is hard to play. By just switch, simply giving it more aftertouch, it became easier to play. Yeah. What a fun thing that we get to do is go in and decipher these situations. Be like, okay, what it is? What is it? What is it? What is it? I love it. I, 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 I was grateful that she had an issue with her piano because then I could figure it out. So speaking of figuring things out, Wednesday, we're doing open Q&A, so go ahead and bring any questions questions about the PTG exam, RPT, flow distance, let off, whatever have you, and we're going to be we're going to be just going into all the questions, whether it's business, whether it's service calls, whether it's packages. I'm here for it. I got questions, so perfect, Robert. <laughs> I'll see you guys on Wednesday.
Bye, See everyone. You. See Thanks. ya.